Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, part of the Marine Protected Area Center webinar series, sponsored by NOAA's National Marine Protected Area Center and OCTO. I'm Zach Canizzo with NOAA's National Marine Protected Area Center, and I will be your moderator today. We're very excited for today's webinar, which is titled Coral Reef Ecoevolutionary Dynamics, Adaptation and Connectivity in MPA Networks Under Future Climate Change, and is presented by Dr. Helen Fox, Dr. Lisa McManus, and Dr. Lucas DiFilippo. Dr. Helen Fox is the Conservation Science Director for the Coral Reef Alliance. Previous positions include leading field engagement for the Allen Coral Atlas at the National Geographic Society, Director of Marine Science at WWF US, and Senior Do Director of Research and Monitoring at RARE. Her work includes investigating links between marine protected area management and governance, ecological impacts, and human well-being. Dr. Fox received her PhD in integrative biology from UC Berkeley in 2002, investigating coral reef recovery and rehabilitation from blast fishing in Indonesia. She has received numerous grants and awards, authored more than 40 scientific publications, logged more than 1,000 dives, and once lived underwater for 10 days in the Aquarius habitat. Our next speaker will be Dr. Lisa McManus, who is a marine ecologist and theoretician. Her research focuses on the ecological and evolutionary drivers of coral reef dynamics, especially the response of coral populations to climate change. She earned a bachelor's degree in marine and atmospheric science from the University of Miami and a PhD in ecology and evolutionary biology at Princeton University. Dr. McManus was subsequently a postdoctoral fellow at Rutgers University, and she has recently started a faculty position this past fall at the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology at UH Manoa. Last but not least, Dr. Lucas De Filippo is a quantitative marine ecologist with a background in fisheries science who is broadly interested in eco-evolutionary approaches to supporting sustainable fisheries and ecosystem management. Dr. De Filippo earned his PhD from the University of Washington, where his re he researched the population dynamics and reproductive ecology of Pacific salmon and the development of new quantitative methods for assessing and managing these species. He is currently a postdoctoral scholar at the University of Washington, where he is working with the NOAA Alaska Fisheries Science Center to study effects of climate change on the distributions of Bering Sea groundfish species. We are very excited to have them here today. But before I turn it over to Dr. Fox, I would like to let you know that we encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation as they occur to you. Please type your questions into the Q&A box, which is on the control panel, which default-wise starts on the right side of your screen, but you may move it around. We will pose these questions to Helen, Lisa, and Lucas, Helen, Lisa, and Lucas at the end of the presentation. With that, I will turn things over to Dr. Fox to begin our webinar. All right, wonderful. Well, thank you so much, uh, Zach and Sarah, for the invitation to present. And thank you to all the attendees. Uh, we're delighted for the opportunity to share this work with you. Uh, and so while the, the three of us on this title slide are the ones who will be speaking to you, uh, next slide, please. This actually uh, represents a much broader effort. Uh, so this is a list of most of the collaborators that we know about, there are probably a few others. Uh, so it's a multi-institutional project and I especially want to acknowledge the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation and uh, for funding as well as the Nature Conservancy Caribbean. Next slide, please. So just to give you an introduction of, well, an overview of what we'll be talking about, I'm giving a brief introduction and setting up the project. Uh, Lisa is really gonna dig into the modeling approach and the results. And then you'll hear about an interesting aspect that Lucas worked on looking at coral restoration. And then I'll come in on at the end to try to wrap it up and talk about sort of what are the conservation implications of this work. Next slide, please which is Jen actually just the introduction, so you can go again, one more slide. Uh, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about the motivation for this work, uh, which uh, started about five or six years ago. So at the Coral Reef Alliance's central question and mission is the one posed here on this slide. Uh, how can we ensure that coral reefs continue uh, to thrive and to provide benefits to wildlife and people? And at this time, we had a 20 or so year history of working on the ground with communities uh, and around sustainable tourism, but with the increasingly dire predictions of cor sorry, coral demise, uh, given the climate scenarios, uh, came to the realization that this work on the ground couldn't scale quickly enough to address the climate threats. So next slide. Um, what emerged from this and 
conversations and discussions was uh, the Modeling Adaptation Potential Project, or MAP. Uh, what we mean by adaptation is the ecological and evolutionary responses to climate change. So there, there are lots of different ways of defining this term. This is what it means for this project. Uh, and the goal was to basically develop uh, the first of its kind eco-evolutionary model uh, to understand how species and ecosystems respond to change and also what are some of the management uh, approaches that are potentially scalable and replicable. replicable. So we uh, used a modeling approach knowing that it's not you know, reality, but it's an effective way to ask the kinds of questions about long-term uh, events in the future that are impossible to do any other way in the field or in the lab. Uh, so with this modeling approach, it's possible to run different scenarios uh, to get a sense of what might happen given various assumptions. And, and Lisa will go into, into that much greater detail. Uh, next slide, please. Just as a very uh, rough overview of uh, sort of some of the various approaches that are out there in terms of what can be done uh, given the, the coral reef crisis, uh, there's efforts to look at thermal refugia. Uh, the 50 reefs effort is a good example of that. Uh, lots of work around restoration. Uh, you know, there's some potential challenges with those. There's uh, genetic engineering or selective breeding, sort of super coral approaches, uh, which are very exciting, but maybe not necessarily scalable at sort of ecological scales. Uh, and then there's a lot of sort of high tech solutions, which again are, are nascent and maybe not so scalable. And so the approach that this uh, MAP project took was based around diversity portfolios. So I'll talk very briefly about that. Uh, next slide. And uh, the uh, yeah, click through, the idea behind a diversity portfolio actually emerged from economists in the 1950s as a way of reducing risk given a variable and unpredictable stock market. And uh, the importance is you know, picking stocks that don't co-vary. Uh, next slide. Uh, it turns out that there's evidence uh, of this in nature as well. Uh, it was first described in salmon stocks where population and life history diversity confers stability of the populations. And so our question, next slide please. Uh, is does this uh, diversity portfolio theory apply to coral reefs, and if so, how? Uh, so with that, uh, the key questions that uh, this work uh, sought to address is, uh, you know, can evolution help rescue reefs from rising temperatures? Uh, what can be done to maximize successful coral adaptation? And then how would accounting for this evolutionary capacity affect spatial management uh, recommendations? So some of those other approaches, for example, uh, 50 reefs doesn't take into account uh, coral genetic variation or the possibility of evolution. So we wanted to look into that. Uh, and so with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Lisa, who will actually get into the, the meat of the model. Okay. Thanks, Helen. Um, so I'd like to start us off by just talking about um, the, some of the most important components or assumptions that go into our eco-evolutionary framework. So uh, the first consideration is that coral larvae disperse. Um, and so in nature, uh, organisms, many organisms, including corals, inhabit patches of habitat that exchange individuals. And so because of this, coral populations are best modeled at two spatial scales. The first is at a single patch or reef, and the second includes that reef network as a whole. And this type of approach is called metapopulation modeling, where essentially we're looking at a population of populations. The second consideration is that reefs experience different environments. Uh, and because of ocean currents, um, sites with very different environmental conditions 
can be exchanging coral larvae. And so larvae, of course, can bring new alleles, which has implications for genetic diversity. And larvae also represent um, individuals that are adapted to cooler or warmer environments, potentially. So third, um, another aspect of our model is that corals exhibit genetic diversity in terms of how they respond to temperature. So there's evidence that corals are locally adapted. And um, in other words, we find that um, there are more heat tolerant corals on reefs that experience higher temperatures, for example. Um, and even within a reef, there is evidence of a diversity of thermal responses. And um, basically one of the motivations for this work was to try to figure out how to take advantage of this diversity and um, how we might be able to harness that in order to facilitate adaptation. Uh, another aspect is that there, are, there is competition with other organisms on reef. Um, probably most famously competition between corals and macroalgae, which are competing for space. And so in our projects where we explicitly consider where to put um, managed or protected areas, uh, we really take this into consideration. And how we do that in our model is that when we choose a site to be protected or locally managed, we are uh, making algal mortality higher, which essentially makes it easier for uh, our coral to grow. And so in an unmanaged area, you do have um, greater competitive effects between coral and macroalgae. And by doing this, we're not uh, implying any specific way of management. So this could be either by protecting more herbivores or perhaps by um, limiting nutrient input locally. So our actual model is um, a set of ordinary differential equations. So I'll just be uh, going over kind of a cartoon version of that to give you some intuition of what we're actually doing. So at each reef patch, we're tracking two different things. First is the change in abundance of the coral. And the second thing we're tracking is the change in their mean trade value. And in our framework, this mean trade value is the optimal growth temperature. And by that, I mean that uh, a coral grows fastest when its trade value perfectly matches the local temperature. So now the first component, so the change in abundance depends on population dynamics. So this includes growth and competition. And it also includes immigration. Um, larvae from other patches are coming into the system. And of course, that changes the abundance locally. Finally, we include a genetic load term, um, which I won't focus on much today, but it's essentially um, a cost for having a very large genetic variation at a reef, which um, we don't really get into too much in our framework. So, that's the change in abundance. The second thing we track is the change in mean trade value. And so um, locally, this trade value can change through selection. So there's a selective force that is pushing that trade value to match with the environmental value, which of course is um, the local temperature. And then um, the last part is that of course the individuals coming into a patch um, are adapted, can be adapted to different environments. And so uh, this gene flow also has an impact in the mean trait value. So we first implemented our model on toy networks or very highly simplified networks um, in order for us to really understand model behavior um, and just to basically see what happens in highly simplified networks. And so the networks we chose to look at um, were regular and random networks. Um, so 
In a regular network, each patch is connected only to its nearest neighbors. And so on top of our networks, we also have an environmental gradient. So we had uh, cooler and warmer reefs, and those are indicated by the colors. So in a regular network, you're only connected to reefs with very similar environment. On the other hand, in random networks, um, you can be connected to both reefs that are far away and reefs that are right next to you in terms of the environment. And so we refer to these random networks as having connectivity shortcuts. So we tested a network of 20 patches, each with four connections. And of course, for the random uh, reefs, the, or the random networks, the results I'll be showing you are a compilation or a mean of several types of random networks. We also tested a couple of different temperature scenarios. So we first ran the model under a constant temperature. And then we also implemented increasing temperature such that the temperature increased for about 250 years and then it leveled off. Um, and so you can see that um, at each patch, it's relatively hotter or cooler based on um, the color. But then for the increasing temperature scenario, they all increased similarly. So the main result we found was that um, regular networks tend to lead to higher abundance overall, uh, especially when we take evolutionary capacity into account. Um, so here I'll be showing you uh, individual patch trajectories for the regular and the random network. The top plots will be relative abundance and the bottom plots will be the mean trait value. And this will all be over time for the increasing temperature scenario. So again, this is um, mean abundance at each patch. And so you can see, especially during that uh, temperature increase period, you can see all the patches decline, but then um, after 100 years or so, they start to recover. Um, and at least for this particular run, so this is under a particular combination of parameters, in the regular network, um, the patches were in the end able to um, regain their coral cover. However, when we look at the random network, we see something different. We do see that initial um, synchronized decline, but then really the only patches that recover well are the cooler ones. And the warmest and intermediate patches um, end up having low coral cover. And we can explain this, we can, or we can help explain this by looking at what's going on with uh, the mean trait value through time and thinking about um, how these patches are evolving. So in the regular network, um, so in the background there, in the more translucent lines is the actual background temperature, whereas the bolder lines um, overlaid are the trait values. So overall in the regular network, each patch is able to, more able to keep up with the local environment. And so at the end there, you have a wide range of mean trait values across the network. Whereas see what's happening in the random network. There's a convergence of the trait values towards the colder end of the spectrum. And what's happening here is at the beginning, um, because random networks have these connectivity shortcuts, you end up having cold and hot patches directly connected to each other. So in the random network, as those colder sites recover, because some of them are getting um, warmer adapted larvae, which is beneficial to them, but then as those colder sites have uh, abundance advantage relative to the rest of the network, they then send out those cooler adapted larvae, um, leading to these kind of gene swamping effects that um, end up, so overall it ends up that random networks uh, can lead to low, lower coral cover overall. So uh, once we got a grasp on the model, um, we decided to go ahead and see what the dynamics looked like on realistic reef networks. And so the question we wanted to ask um, for this particular project was that, was what are the factors that determine reef 
persistence, at least um, individually. And so we, instead of just having one coral, we now added a second one. So in this part of the project, we had two different species or two different coral functional types. So the first is our fast growing coral with a narrow thermal tolerance. And the second was slower growing, but it had a wider thermal tolerance. And you can picture that here. So uh, this is growth rate, and then that W is the width of their thermal tolerance. So basically we imposed a trade-off. Um, fast coral grows fast, but it doesn't do so well over a wide range of temperatures, whereas it's the opposite for the slow coral. We also considered different levels of genetic variance, which is basically what powers um, the evolutionary component of our model. So with a higher genetic variance, there's typically a faster evolutionary response. And finally, we looked at different um, temperature and connectivity metrics um, that are commonly used in the literature to describe these reef networks um, to kind of link everything together in terms of the local persistence at a patch. So we used connectivity data um, based on larval dispersal studies um, that use ocean circulation models. And then we also run the model under two different temperature scenarios. Um, a less, the less severe RCP 4.5 and uh, business as usual RCP 8.5. And we ran these models until 2300. So the networks we focused on were the Caribbean, um, the Coral Triangle, and the Southwest Pacific. So we used published uh, connectivity matrices uh, for, for these regions. So now I'm showing you, right now I'm showing you results for the Caribbean. This is for the entire reef, so a mean across the entire network. So up top is coral cover through time, and in the bottom is uh, their, the temperature uh, and also the mean trait value. Um, so up top, the solid line um, represents uh, RCP 4.5, whereas the dashed is RCP 8.5. And so what this result is showing us is that when we have high genetic variance, so that's that V term there, um, that's what we deemed as the high level, uh, so strong evolution. Um, basically, all our networks did very well, um, except you know there might have been a dip at some point uh, at the beginning of the simulations. And essentially, these results um, held for the entire region. And just in the bottom plots, I want you to notice that when there's high genetic variance or strong evolution, the mean trait values are able to keep up with the temperatures across the reef. When we assume that there's no genetic variance, um, this led to a decline under both of our scenarios. So again, I'm showing you the Caribbean first here. So now we have these purple lines for when uh, there's no evolutionary potential. And in all cases, um, pretty much everything declines. The Southwest Pacific and the Coral Triangle kind of had more of a fighting chance under the less severe scenario. But overall, um, this is a strong indication of a decline. Um, but I think where it gets kind of interesting is when we have the intermediate genetic variance scenario. And what we see here is that when there's when we have RCP 4.5, when warming is limited, um, the reef networks are able to do well. But then under RCP 8.5, so that's it's hard to see, but it's uh, the teal. Um, the teal dashed line, um, the network's experience decline. So here we see an interaction with the strength of the evolutionary potential, the additive genetic variance, and um, warming. And this pretty much holds true for um, the other two networks as well. And just to remind all of you, so I've been showing you averages across the network, but 
we were tracking this um, across space, right? So we can actually take a look, for example, here's a plot in the Caribbean showing initial cover and minimum cover. Um, and one of the reasons we focus on minimum cover is it's an indicator basically of how bad um, it could get potentially. So remember, we also had a couple of different coral species. Um, and so uh, up top in orange is the fast coral and uh, the slow coral is in teal. And they exhibit very different behaviors. So I was showing you a, a combined percent cover in the previous slides, but if we look at them individually, we can see that the fast coral had an initial steep decline, but was able to recover faster. Whereas the slow coral um, kind of has a slow decline the whole time. Um, and we can see that if we look at their mean trade values. So basically the fast coral is able to, to really keep up with that um, local temperature in terms of their mean trade value. And we had similar results across regions. And basically just this is all just to say that they do have different response but overall both species or both coral types were essential for maintaining cover throughout these simulations when we look at um, each individual reef so we ended up uh, developing a statistical model because the output was so complex and when we looked at individual site characteristics um, what led to persistence or sites that may or ended up with high coral cover had strong destination strength that that means that they had high potential to have a lot of incoming larvae so this is regardless of trait value regardless of trait value if you had a lot of larvae coming your way uh, as a patch you stood a better chance of persisting but also being a relatively cool reef in the network had uh, gave you a strong advantage um, and this is because as we saw in the other work um, we know that getting pre-adapted or warm adapted larvae uh, as the temperature is increasing is an enormous advantage and so being cooler in the network was highly advantageous but of course, um, these reefs only did well because they had warmer source reefs. So this leads us into um, our, our most active project at this point. Um, and this is where we're now trying to decide, well, given everything we've learned, where should we put marine protected areas or where should we focus local management? Um, and so what well, we ended up doing was um, implementing a set of marine protected areas across 30% of each of the three networks in various ways. So we tested different strategies. Um, and so, for example, one of the strategies, we randomly chose reefs, um, but I would caution you to think of the random strategy as more of a diversity or portfolio strategy um, and not just reefs where they're easy to protect. Um, and then we also tested a variety of other ones. So coldest sites, the warmest sites, um, sites with um, different types of connectivity metrics. And so again, just to remind you, so in our model, when we designate a site as an MPA, we are increasing macroalgal mortality. So now in this set of models, um, we had one coral and an algae. And so when it was an unmanaged area, there was stronger competition from the algae, whereas in a locally managed area, uh, the coral had more of an advantage. So essentially, at least for, for the Caribbean, most strongly, um, we found that the random or our diversity strategy was pretty hard to beat in terms of um, effects for the entire network. So right now I'm showing you the mean minimum abundance across the network. Um, and again, this is an indicator of how bad it could get, right, in those simulation trajectories. Um, so the random network, I, that's actually you know, a very 
skinny box plot uh, because of course there are different um, ways you could randomize it, um, but it, it was pretty hard to beat. And, you know, we think it's because we are protecting both cooler sites and warmer sites, um, as well as a diverse collection of the other metrics that we studied. So uh, these are just, you know, a list of all the other ones. Uh, but basically it was, you know, if we're looking at a network wide response, it was uh, really just the random or the diverse strategy that was the best. So now I'll hand it over to Lucas, who will be talking about uh, the reef restoration component. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, in addition to MPAs, there are a number of other levers, so to speak, that are available to managers for reef conservation efforts. Uh, one approach that's already being widely applied in some areas is reef restoration. Uh, restoration can mean a lot of different things, but in the context of our work, we're specifically talking about what we call propagate and transplant restoration, where corals are fragged, grown out in controlled settings, and then distributed throughout the reef as a means to rebuild coral populations and reef habitat. In addition to this more familiar form of restoration, there's also been growing interest in whether it's possible to plant corals on the reef that might introduce beneficial traits and help corals adapt to global stressors like climate change. These approaches have been collectively described as assisted evolution, and broadly involve the selection of corals deemed to be better adapted to future conditions such as warming oceans. Um, for instance, in the photo on the bottom here, we have two coral colonies of the same species side by side that were exposed to a high temperature event. And while the colony on the left has suffered bleaching, the colony on the right is doing just fine. And scenes like this can be indicative of corals' natural genetic variation and heat tolerance. And so scientists have wondered if we can harness this genetic variation to introduce these heat tolerant genes into coral populations to help them evolve and adapt to climate change more quickly. These strategies could take a number of different forms, such as assisted migration, where presumably hot adapted colonies from warmer regions are transplanted to a target reef to introduce heat resistant genes, or corals could be selectively bred for heat tolerance and captivity, or even undergo direct genetic manipulations through technologies like CRISPR. And while there's a lot of interest in these approaches right now, there's also a lot of potential risks. And so it's important that they're evaluated thoroughly before being applied. Next slide, please. Uh, fortunately, an eco-evolutionary simulation model like ours is a great way to test methods like these out. And so we adapted the modeling framework that Lisa introduced and simulated a simple regular network of 20 reefs, which varied in their local temper temperature regime from hot to cold, and we expose this network to an increase in temperature over 500 years. Next slide, please. And as climate change is occurring, we can simulate various forms of propagate and transplant restoration and assisted evolution to see if they help corals withstand the warming temperatures. Uh, one of the first things that we look at is how much new coral we add to the reef each year. And this amount is expressed as a proportion of the total habitat area of a given site that is added each year for all 500 years of the climate change trajectory. So for instance, we could add a very small fraction of new coral cover each year to a site, such as 0.0001% of its area. Next slide, please. Or we could add a much larger fraction like 1%. Next slide, please. And 1% might not seem like a lot, but just to put this in context, uh, restoring the Great Barrier Reef at this rate would amount to adding over 60, 66 and a half square miles of new coral cover every year for 500 years, which would be a really astronomical effort and far beyond the scale at which restoration activities are currently being pursued. Next slide, please. In addition to the amount of new coral being added every year, we can also look at changing the heat tolerance or trait value of the new corals that we're adding. So remember that each site in this network has a different temperature regime, and the corals that live there are locally adapted to that temperature through their heat tolerance trait. Next slide, please. And so we can add new corals to a given site that have a trait value equal to that of the coral population that already lives there. This would amount to a trait enhancement of zero degrees, and this could represent collecting colonies from a given reef, propagating them, and then returning them to that same reef, 
or in other words, this is kind of what, what restoration as it is currently practiced looks like. Next slide, please. Alternatively, we could add these uh, enhanced super corals, as they're sometimes called, that have a higher heat tolerance than the existing population as a way to introduce heat tolerant alleles. In the schematic here, we're adding corals that have a heat tolerance that's three degrees higher than the existing coral population at the target site, which some available evidence suggests is around the upper range of the natural variation that exists in this trait. Next slide, please. Uh, and so far, we've been talking about restoration and assisted evolution in terms of just one site within the network. And while we assume that we might not be able to practically restore the entire network all at once, we assume that we can choose four out of the 20 sites to focus our efforts, which leaves us with a choice about which areas to target. Next slide, please. On the one hand, we might want to focus on sites that have the hottest temperature regimes, and thus are going to be the most vulnerable to climate change. Next slide, please. Or alternatively, we might focus on the coldest sites, which represent refugia from climate change. Next slide, please. Or finally, we could target a portfolio of sites, such that we are spreading our efforts across a diversity of different reefs that have different temperature regimes. Next slide, please. And so looking at the results of these simulations, each panel here represents a different spatial design with a strategy targeting thermal refugia or cold sites on the left, a strategy targeting hot sites in the middle, and a portfolio of sites on the far right. And in each panel on the y-axis, we have the average proportional amount of coral cover across the whole reef network that was left at the end of the climate change trajectories. So a value of one means that all 20 sites were completely dominated by coral, while a value of zero means that no coral survived climate change despite our efforts. And on the x-axis of each panel, we have the proportional amount of new coral cover that was being added to the target reefs each year as part of a given restoration design. And in each panel of the results we're going to see, the light green dots represent outcomes from restoration that occurred without any trait enhancement, so no assisted evolution, and the dark green dots represent outcomes from restoration that occurred with assisted evolution. Next slide, please. So looking first at our results from the cold site strategy, we can see that in the absence of any restoration or assisted evolution, there are no corals left at the end of our climate change simulations. And it's really not until we get into the territory of adding around 0.001% per year that we start to see any positive outcomes in terms of coral persistence. And even then, this is only when restoration includes assisted evolution. As we ramp up our restoration inputs from here, we start to see very much the same results, except that finally, at input levels of around 1% per year, we start to see restoration in the absence of assisted evolution start to have a positive effect too. Next slide, please. Looking at some of the other spatial designs, like the strategy targeting the hottest sites, uh, we see that the input threshold needed to have a positive effect is very much the same as for the cold strategy. But the outcomes themselves are quite a bit better, both with and without assisted evolution. Next slide, please. And similarly, targeting a portfolio of sites performs pretty comparably to the hot strategy. And these variations in outcomes between spatial designs reflect that the hot and portfolio strategies offer benefits that a strategy targeting thermal refugia does not, namely the preservation of sites with hot adapted coral populations, which serve as a source of beneficial hot adapted larvae for the rest of the reef. And in the case of the portfolio strategy, also spacing the benefits of restoration more evenly across space and temperature regime throughout the network. Next slide, please. And so kind of taking all of these results together, there's a number of key points that start to emerge. Um, we see that restoration without assisted evolution is unlikely to confer benefits in terms of climate resilience unless the inputs are extremely large. And while assisted evolution cuts down on the volume of outplanting that is needed to have a positive effect, the input levels required for this strategy to produce results are still quite substantial, especially if you consider the extra effort that might be involved in identifying and creating these super corals. But if you are going to pursue either restoration or assisted evolution with the goal of climate resilience, it seems most productive to target your efforts at the most thermally vulnerable areas or a portfolio of sites rather than focusing on climate refugia. Uh, there's a number of caveats that are worth noting about this work. Um, for starters, all of the simulations assume that 100% of all the corals being added to the target reef survive transplantation which data from existing restoration efforts suggest is actually much lower in practice. And we're also assuming that warming is the only main stressor here, and so it's relatively easy to create corals that are better adapted. 
But in reality, corals face multiple stressors at both local and global scales, which naturally complicates the selection of advantageous genotypes and also may interact with one another in ways that can't be readily predicted in advance. And so in several ways, our results may even represent an overly optimistic look at these strategies. However, it's also important to note that restoration can offer a number of other benefits beyond climate resilience, like uh, community engagement, restoring habitat over more immediate time horizons, and even augmenting standing genetic diversity as a way to promote corals' natural adaptive capacity. And we didn't consider any of these important potential benefits here. Uh, next slide, please. And so with that, I'm going to hand it off to Helen, who's going to talk about how some of these conservation principles that we've talked about are actually being applied. Great. Thank you so much, Lisa and Lucas. Uh, I'll now try to wrap up uh, in a few minutes. Uh, basically, having asked the what if questions with the models, we're now thinking about the so what and the what's next. Uh, next slide, please. I also want to mention that the adaptation work uh, is getting into the scientific literature. Uh, as you can see, there are a few papers out already and multiple others at various stages in the pipeline. Next slide, please. So from this work, uh, what we're seeing, uh, these are the headlines that we're seeing emerging. Uh, much of this follows existing best practices and guidelines for the establishment of resilient MPA networks, uh, but basically uh, the evolution and decreasing that climate uh, change is seen as key to coral survival. And then uh, a lot of the rest, as I mentioned, is this best practices of uh, MPA networks. And uh, one thing to add, though, is all of these results point to the importance of diversity, a diversity of thermal uh, regimes, not just climate refugia. Next slide, please. Uh, and I also want to reiterate uh, what Lisa mentioned, that uh, built into the model is the assumption that direct threats to reefs can be reduced through management so that the coral can outcompete the algae. Uh, so the Coral Reef Alliance and other conservation organizations work on this in several ways, uh, trying to ensure that there are healthy herbivorous fish populations. Uh, focusing on the clean water that uh, coral need to survive, uh, and in all of this, working with local communities as environmental stewards. And so what we see this work is layering on top of this the, the adaptation science work and figuring out the implications uh, for this local work. Next slide, please. And so, yeah, we're at this sort of phase where we're trying to translate the modeling science that you just heard about into action. Uh, and our three main goals uh, include working with experts and thought leaders, many of whom I saw on this uh, webinar, uh, to uh, think about how these results uh, interface with existing conservation tools and guidelines and management approaches. Uh, secondly, because um, the results suggest that we need to maximize this adaptive potential. Uh, how would we protect a diverse array of options for the future? Uh, a little bit more of that on the next slide. And then finally, what are the policy windows to identify MPA networks that are ripe for management improvements? Uh, so for example, the Convention on Biological Diversity is in the process of negotiating post-2020 Aichi targets over the coming year, uh, and some governments have already committed to ambitious targets of 30% of protected area uh, land and ocean by 2030. So can we tap into those efforts? Next slide, please. So on, this is just a little more on that second idea. Uh, the last time I participated in a NOAA science webinar uh, was to talk about the Allen Coral Atlas. Uh, this is an unprecedented global coral reef mapping effort that's ongoing now uh, and due to be completed later in the year. Uh, as a reminder, you can check out their website at uh, allencoralatlas.org. Uh, in this uh, image, the large one is actually NOAA's Coral Reef Watch sea surface temperature data. Uh, they, they, have collaborated with the Atlas to put, have that be available. And it's also showing one of the, the new products created by the Atlas. 
uh, the geomorphic zones, which is the underlying geological formations in the reef. Uh, and we wonder if these morphological features can be used as a proxy for habitat diversity, uh, which then it, there's some evidence to think that might be associated with the thermal diversity and the genetic diversity that uh, Lisa and Lucas just presented as critical for evolutionary rescue for coral reefs. Uh, so if such a proxy can be developed, uh, that because the atlas is global, that could then be used to identify potential areas that have high adaptive potential. That could get incorporated in as a GIS layer into MarkSan for marine spatial planning processes. So those are just some early ideas of what we would hope to be able to do as next steps. Uh, next slide, please. And so to wrap up, uh, the this sort of Research that you just heard about supports existing recommendations uh, that we focus on protecting networks of healthy reefs, uh, that if you can click through, please, Lisa, uh, that are diverse, uh, including habitat diversity, thermal regimes, species, and genetic diversity. Uh, next, that are well connected, uh, and also that are large, sort of so that they're at the scale uh, that's needed for long term persistence given the, the uncertainty that uh, is we know is coming. Uh, so with that, uh, thank you all so much. And we it looks like there are a lot of questions. So Zach, I'll look to you to sort of moderate that and how you how you want to handle that. Thank you all so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everybody. So we'll go ahead and start our Q&A session. We do already have a number of questions that mm -hmm. have come in. So I will ask the panelists to go ahead and turn your cameras on while we answer questions. And I will also ask the audience to continue bringing in the questions and we will get to as many of them as we possibly can. The first question is for Lisa, noting that when you mentioned genetic variants, is that of the coral itself or does it include the symbionts? So, right, it's the coral as a holobiont. So we're not differentiating between a coral animal or the symbiont. It's kind of um, all together, right? So things like, I don't know, symbiont shuffling and such aren't explicitly in there, but it's part of uh, the variation possible for the holobiont. Great, thank you. Uh, one for everybody asks, they wonder if it would be possible to couple this model with physical oceanography hydro or hydrology models that could indicate likely changes in current patterns, such as velocity and direction and seasonality, as well as freshwater inputs from land, which in turn might affect not only coral larvae dispersal, but also coral health and resilience in the face of multiple stressors. So coupling this model with a larger uh, physical hydrological model. So, so yeah, so our model already takes in uh, the connectivity matrix, right, that's produced by ocean circulation models, and each of those components I mentioned, you could link those to um, all of those inputs you were talking about. So, for example, um, you could add in something in terms of the larval mortality, or I guess that would be kind of the dispersal rate almost. So it's just a matter of choosing the most appropriate component of the model. And then instead of it being a constant, like it is now, it would then be a function of your input. But then I do warn that, you know, you can link these things together, but even something as straightforward, or you'd think straightforward um, as degree heating weeks and mortality, we actually don't even really understand that very well, right? So the hard part, you know, incorporating it in the model is not the hard part. The hard part is justifying that link, um, you know, based on empirical data. So yes, yeah, so you can add whatever you want. You can make the model respond to whatever you want, but it's, you know, requires some careful thought for sure. Oh, Zach, you're muted. <laughs> Thank you, sorry about that. Thanks. Before I move on to the next question, I just want to note for everyone that we had an attendee uh, provide a preprint preprint of some research they thought might be of interest. So that is in your chat box. It should pop up for you on your um, on your dashboard. So you should be able to get at that. Next question asks: Given the 500-year runtime of the model, does the random MPA placement portfolio approach include temporal dynamics? For example, the placement of MPA changes given spatial patterns of temperature in the region at a given time. 
Um, so, I mean, the, the data is there and that's actually interesting. Um, I wonder, we, we haven't looked at um, what those temporal or how the temporal dynamics within the, the random strategy or various random strategies compare to each other. So while we could do that, we just, you know, haven't focused on that um, in this work, but that could be really interesting. Um, certainly, you know, it's basically we have coral cover through time for all of the patches. So that's something that, you know, could be could be looked at in the future. Thank you. Good question. We have a few questions that have come in related to connectivity and how connectivity works in the model. So I'm going to ask them both and then we can go ahead and whoever wants to answer those. The first is, oh, I'm sorry, they're jumping around as questions come in. Mm -hmm. How does the connectivity matrix link to the model? Does it vary by year or is it just a mean connection constant through time? And the second asks, uh, is directed towards Lisa asking uh, that she says that you mentioned that you use connectivity as an input into your model of coral abundance. And would you be able to go more in depth into which ocean models you're using to calculate connectivity over those reefs? So two questions. The first is, is connectivity constant over time? And the second yeah. is, how are you using uh, current models to calculate connectivity over the reefs? Yes, yeah, so connectivity is constant over time. So um basically we ch so we got work um from basically eric trimmel and then also um a group um with joni kleppas and diane thompson and um, several other people but basically we just we either took uh use the connectivity matrix that was an average oh, average across you know many many years or we used a matrix that was like uh, a neutral year, for example. Um, and so, right, unfortunately, I mean, it would be great if we had the that type of time varying data, but uh, as some of you that work with these matrices know often, you know, there's maybe three to five years or so, or um, actually in, um, for the Coral Triangle, we did have a 47 year data set, but we just chose to use um, average connectivity there because you know, it's 47 years and not the full uh, 2100, 2300 uh, time series that we needed. So yes, connectivity is constant. Um, and the second one was um, talking about uh, connectivity as an input. Sorry, Zach, I kind of forgot that second question. Yeah, no problem. Asking uh, which ocean current models are used to calculate connectivity over the reefs. Yeah, so um, I can, so right, uh, some of the, let me see if I know the citations off of my head. So in the Caribbean, we, it's Schill et al, 2015. Um, so I think that's based on uh, basically Eric Tremel's uh, particle tracking. Uh, I don't know, I forget the underlying ocean circulation model. Um, in the Southwest Pacific, uh, another that was another Eric Tremel product. Um, and then for the Coral Triangle, um, the citation for that is Thompson et al, 2018, and that is based on ROMs, um, those outputs. Um, so sorry, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't know the other uh, citations or the underlying uh, oceanographic model. But um, if someone wants to email me, I'm, I'm happy to um, email them the PDFs. Thank you. Uh, we do have a question um, that directed more towards Lucas. Uh, what's the density of corals in the coral cover scenarios that you mentioned? So you noted the percentage of the reef. Did you have any measure of density of the corals? Yeah, um, the way it's set up is density isn't really something that's quantifiable. The Each network is kind of just assumed to be a certain space and then it's a fraction of that space that's either occupied by coral or occupied by macroalgae or vacant. So basically, if coral live there, the density is one. If not, the density is zero. Great, thank you. Uh, noting that the assisted there was an assisted evolution conversation related mm -hmm. to heat tolerance. Someone asks if this will make reefs in the Arabian and Persian Gulf more very much in demand. Potentially, yeah. Um, those are, to my knowledge, those are corals that are 
you know, pre-adapted to hot temperatures and can withstand temperatures that, that bleach corals in other areas. Um, obviously, there's a lot of caveats. I think there was one study that found that um, due to the different salinity in those environments, that then when you take them and put them into a reef that has normal salinity, it actually reduces their tolerance to these high, high temperatures. So you have to consider these other environmental factors that are going on in the background and also other stressors as well. I think that's a really important consideration. Great, thank you. Uh, we have another question asking, do you think that more effort is needed for having more accurate model dis larvae dispersal models? For instance, using circulation data for the seasons, different species spawn and uh, different species spawns and taking several scenarios of circulation. Yes, of course. Um, you know, that's th this. This is basically the a, a nice bare bones framework. But if we want precise output, um, and you know, if we want to modify these for very specific areas um, and smaller spatial scales, I mean, we need we need more data, right? So often these dispersal connectivity matrices they're parameterized for a generic Acropora. For example, right? Or you know, and obviously, you know, we know these things. We know there's not just one or two functional types or species on a reef. Um, and so, yes, absolutely. I mean, I think each of those components we need more data. I mean, and even the genetic variation part. I mean, the reason we tested a range was because we don't really know. Um, the studies we have now are for very, you know, just for a handful of sites and a handful of species and so yes definitely i mean i think uh you know one of the roles of of theory is to guide and perhaps inspire uh more empirical work because i mean this is not this is just th the start right we had it's highly simplified um we made so many assumptions and so if we want more precise output we need better data that's going um that's serving as input for this model and, and I would just add to that, I, I certainly agree. And at the same time, I would argue that the, the outputs that we have are also sufficient to guide existing management action. So that shouldn't be a, you know, not having that shouldn't be a, a reason for delaying the, the work that, that has already for decades been, been shown to be necessary. Great, thank you. Um, we have time for at least one more question. So this question will be, how can MPA effectiveness be taken into account in the model? Um, yeah, so just, you know, first, just as like the easiest way one could do that is uh, different levels of uh, algal mortality, right? So in sites that are actually a very well-managed MPAs, algal mortality could be even higher, right? I mean, that's just, you could have a range of those. So we just had a binary like, yes, MPA, no MPA, right? But you could, just that, you could make that um, a series of levels. You could also, you know, change the other parameters. Maybe at that patch that's well managed, maybe we have higher reproduction, right? Maybe coral growth is higher. Maybe there's less coral mortality. There's a lot of uh, aspects of the model you could change. Again, it's just a question of you have to justify each of those changes. And of course, it's always better to start simple, right? More simple, more general, but then you can you can change whatever you want in the model if you have a good reason to. Thank you. All right, last question because I love these types of questions for the scientists out there. Which biological data gaps are most important for informing these types of models? Larval traits, reproductive outputs for species, etc. Uh, I mean, hard to choose um, a winner really, but. Um, I would say what I'm most desperate for um, is that additive genetic variance or just like genetic variation, um, however we can measure that. For example, uh, within, you know, at, at what scales do they apply? And I mean, Helen hinted at the Allen Coral Atlas. I mean, we know that there are microhabitats within reefs. It's like, how does that link to diversity? I mean, I understand these, these, um, Molecular studies are very intensive. I mean, some of them, you know, you need to like breed the corals and such. Um, so yeah, I think I'm most desperate for the uh, evolutionary data, the additive genetic variants, but all the rest of it is also important.
Great, thank you. And I'm seeing nodding heads, so it looks like we have agreement amongst the panel there. So unfortunately, Definitely. that's the end of our time. There are a few questions we weren't able to get to, but the questions will be given to all of the panelists after the presentation. So I would like to thank all of you for attending and thank Dr. Fox, Dr. McManix, and Dr. Filippo for their presentation. Thank you, everybody. That's the end of our webinar today. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.